Well, while we're, <clears throat> while we're looking for the clicker, I'll do all the preliminary stuff that I've seen everybody else do. I have no conflicts. And uh, what I hope we learn from this today is, is kind of the way that uh, anthropologists determine what the diet of early man was. I mean, we're all kind of into the paleo diet and we think it's important and it's, it would be nice to know what the paleo diet really was. Okay, I want to start off. The, <clears throat> this was from a book by Mark Nathan Cohen, who is an anthropologist. He wrote a book called Health and the Rise of Civilization. And he says something really interesting. The field of medicine often appears, appears naive about the full range of human biological experience, basing conclusions about human health, even about what's normal, on the comparatively narrow experience of contemporary Western society. This is the, you know, the, the, the grass blade width of the football field that CJ was talking about yesterday. And we've got a whole huge database going back a couple of million years that we can look at that gives us a lot of information and that's what we're going to talk about today. Not working now? <laughs> Maybe I got to get closer. Let's see. Yeah, I'm pushing the wrong thing. Let's what do see. I push? Goes backwards. It goes backwards but not forwards? It went forward once. Now, I wouldn't be me if I didn't start out with a book. And this is a, a book by a crusty old New York doctor named Blake Donaldson. And this was written back in the early 60s. And Donaldson was interesting because he had a, a practice in Manhattan. He actually practiced in World War I. He had trained prior to World War I. Had a lot of experience in a wide uh, range of, of patient settings. But one day he called uh, Wilhelmar Stephenson, the famous uh, explorer, out to his house on Long Island to kind of instruct him about the paleo diet. And what Donaldson figured out from talking to, uh, uh, <laughs> that's all right, talking to Stephenson, the conclusion that he came to is during the millions of years that our ancestors lived by hunting every weakling who could not maintain perfect health on fresh fat meat and water was bred out. And based on this, uh, Donaldson changed his practice to one in which he treated people with a full meat diet. That's all he gave them to eat. He gave them the meat diet and a little bit of a potato and some black coffee and that was it. And if you came into his office and you were overweight, you got the all meat diet. If you came into his office and you had heart disease, you got the all meat diet. If you came into his office and you had arthritis, you got the all meat diet. Whatever you had, he gave it to you. He gave you to put you on the all meat diet because he thought that was the diet that humans should be on. Now you can still find Donaldson's book on uh, Amazon if you want to. It's really an interesting book to read, but I've got to warn you, especially the people on this side of the table, after the comments that I heard yesterday about the male doctor's picture on the PAH site, Donaldson was a, uh, a yes, you will be outraged because he's very <laughs> condescending toward women. And, uh, you know, that, and so you've got to be, you got to be careful with that. Okay, next. Now, this is, a, this is some data I got from Lauren Cordain, and this just goes to show, this is kind of uh, what C.J. Hunt was talking about yesterday, about the length of the football field, which is all up here. The, this is the, the, the number of generations that we've gone through sort of proto-humans until the agricultural revolution came along. And, uh, and it's only a very short time that we've been eating um, agricultural products. Next, please. And so 99.6 of all homo generations had no evolutionary experience with commonly consumed modern foods introduced during the Neolithic. Now, I want to talk to you about, that. I want to start out because I'm going to go over four different ways that anthropologists have kind of figured out what the paleo diet was. And this is the first one, and this is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful paper by Leslie Aiello and Peter Wheeler. It's called the Expensive Tissue Hypothesis, and it was a grand thought experiment and uh, that, that kind of changed the way anthropologists look at things. Next slide. Now, she started out using the work of a guy named Max Kleiber, who was a Swiss physiologist who spent most of his career at University of California at Davis. Click, please. And he wrote a, a book called The Fire of Life based on all of his uh, work on metabolism. And the, uh, the Fire of Life, if you can find it, is hugely expensive. I happen to get this one. It wasn't very expensive. The last time I saw one of these, it was about $2,000. 
But anyway, Kleiber, um, quick please, wrote a bunch of papers, and one of the ones that he wrote uh, in the physiological reviews, and this is the actual graph that's in there. So this shows you how um, graphics have improved in medical and scientific journals since whenever this was, 1947. And this is called the Kleiber line. And what Kleiber did is he was trying to find a way to compare metabolic rate to body weight. And, and he turn, it turns out it's a pretty linear ratio. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether you're looking at an elephant or a cow or a rat, they fall on this line. Okay, so that's called the Kleiber line. And this is where Leslie Ilo started out in her work. Next slide, please. And even, even uh, human males and human females fit right along this line. And so what, what she did uh, was when they looked at, at the different metabolic rates of all the organs, because you know, your heart has a metabolic rate, your kidneys, your liver, your gut, your brain, everything has a metabolic rate, and they all add up to your total resting metabolic rate. And what she did when they, when they looked at primates that weighed about 65 grams, uh, pardon me? Kilograms. Kilograms, I'm sorry. Uh, primates that weighed about 65 grams or animals that weighed about 65 grams, they found this ratio that the brain burned that much, the gut this much, the liver this much, the kidney and the heart. And that was sort of the expected finding. But then, next slide, when they looked at primates and especially humans, they found that it was much different, that the brain burned up a whole lot more. Now, because of the metabolic constraints by the Kleiber line, it doesn't mean that you have a bigger brain so your rate of metabolism goes up, you still fall on the line, which means that something has to give to develop the bigger brain. And what they discovered is what gave was the gut. So brains got bigger and guts got smaller. Livers didn't change, kidneys didn't change, hearts didn't change, but the, the gut and the brain sort of had an inverse relationship. Next slide, please. And what they found out, that, or what she realized is that the mass specific metabolic rate of the brain is about nine times higher than the rate of the body as a whole. And so if you look at the relative uh, uh, brain mass versus relative gut mass in primates, in general, you can see this. Next slide, please. And you can see that HOMO is way down here. They've got the biggest brain to gut ratio of any primate. All right, next slide, please. And if you look at, if you look at these uh, uh, sort of uh, skeletal, skeletons, this is a Australopithecus afarensis, that's Lucy. Uh, this is a chimpanzee over here, this is a modern human. You can see if you extrapolate down there that, that they all had big bellies. You look at a chimpanzee, it's got big belly. You look at the human, and the human's actually got a waistline. Next slide, please. Here you can see the same, uh, same thing as some other primates. Next slide. Click. Okay, this is a gorilla. You can see this in a gorilla. Click, please. And you can see it in a chimpanzee. And click, please. And you can see a hunter-gatherer. Now this is a hunter-gatherer from Greenland, and, and this, uh, there's a whole book that I stumbled onto, written by a guy named Huygard, which we'll call Huygard for obvious reasons. But anyway, he went to Greenland as part of a research project he was doing back in the late 30s. He found uh, Inuit in Greenland that, that were, had never really been contacted. They were on a, a, a traditional Inuit diet, and he measured everything there was to measure in them, and he also took lots of photographs of both male and female, and this guy's clothed, but a lot of them were nude. It was really the first time I'd ever seen pictures of, of true hunter-gatherers uh, naked, and this is about what they look like. And the, um, so you can see that he's got a waistline as compared to the gorilla and the chimpanzee. Next slide, please. Now, why did, did they have big bellies back then? It's because this is what they had to eat. If you look at the plant food required to, to provide 65% of a 3,000 calorie diet, this is what you get. Now you don't get all of that, but if you were to do it with any one of these things, it would take you 8.2 pounds of apples to get 65% of 3,000 calories. It would take you 10.3 pounds of carrots, 23.5 pounds of tomatoes, a lot of food in terms of, of how much it weighs and how big it is. And remember, these are all fi uh, figures from modern foods that have been Luther Burbanked 
to make them sweeter and, uh, and more palatable. If you take the foods that would have been available back then, they're going to be much more fibrous and you're going to have a, the weights are going to be a lot bigger. So they had to have large guts to process this. Okay, next slide. Now, if you look at in the, the increase in capacity of the brain of humans and, and sort of proto-humans, you can see it drifted along and it changed a little bit. And right about the time we really started eating meat, it just accelerates upward. And that's when the, the, the sort of the human architecture changed as well. And we got rid of the big bellies and started getting a waistline and increasing brain size. Next, please. And what, what the, before Leslie Aiello came along, the thinking was because they knew, people knew, I mean, she didn't discover that people had larger brains, but uh, people knew this. And they thought that, that people got the larger brains because they had a more complex foraging behavior, that that drove the growth of the brain at the expense of the gut. And what she pretty much figured out, it was the increased energy availability from the higher quality of diet that drove the brain, which in turn allowed the smaller gut or the gut to, to decrease or diminish in size. Next slide, please. Again. And so we didn't really evolve to eat meat. We evolved because we ate meat. And this was said much better by a friend of mine, Click, named Lierre Keith, who wrote this great book called The Vegetarian Myth. If any of you have friends that are vegetarians for ideological reasons, they should read this book. But anyway, she said the wild herds of aurochs, which are primitive cattle and horses invented us out of their bodies, their nutrient dense tissues gestating the human brain. And I made a little tweak on my slides last night because I, I happened to, uh, uh, I looked at Facebook, which is always a mistake, but there was this great cartoon that appeared on there that's just perfect to follow up this slide. You can go ahead and click it. <laughs> and, and basically, what her point is in her book, among other things, because she had all kinds of health problems from being a vegetarian, but mainly the point of her book was that just because you're on a vegetarian diet doesn't mean that animals didn't have to die to provide you with that diet. And you're sort of being species chauvinistic if you, if you want the, you know, if you don't want to kill a cow, but you don't mind killing a rabbit or a gopher or a ground squirrel or a rat or something. So anyway, next slide, please. Okay, I want to get into the next way. And this way is, is a, a method that really fascinates me of determining what, what ancient man ate. Now, this is a mass spectrometer. Next slide, please. And we're going to, you guys all know this, I'm going to go look at this really, really great stable isotope analysis. The atomic nucleus is a proton plus neutrons. Click. And, uh, oh, click, yeah. An element is made. Click, we all know this. Uh, click. The number of protons equal the atomic weight, click. And the number of protons plus neutrons equal the atomic mass, click. And so if you take a regular carbon atom, a carbon 12, uh, it's got six protons and uh, typically six neutrons, but it can have six, seven, or eight. And its atomic weight is 12, its atomic mass is a little over 12 because the average of the protons weight is, is more than than the 12, uh, because carbon 13 and carbon 14 weigh a little bit more, but they're a very small part of what makes up the overall carbon atom. Okay, click. So let's take a look at carbon 13, atomic weight of 13, click. You can see that come in. So the other, the other neutron joins the thing, giving it an atomic weight of 13, click. And so the elements with different atomic weights, isotopes, click. Uh, so you got carbon-12, carbon-13. Now these are called stable isotopes because they don't change. When you eat food, you absorb the carbon from the food. These end up in your tissues and they're really stable. They don't, they don't change over time. Click. You got carbon-14. It does change. It's not stable. And it's the one that they use for carbon dating because it has a known rate of decay and you can calculate and, and by going backwards, figure out how old something is. Click, please. We're not going to use it because it's, uh, it's not stable. Click again. And you've got nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15, and both of those are stable isotopes. So this is how you do stable isotope analysis. Click. Uh, stable isotope analysis, there's been no change in the ratio between them over time. Click again. 
um, the ratio differs between two carbon containing substances. So any two carbon containing substances will have a different ratio between C12 and C13. All right, click please. And so when a sample goes to the mass spec, it determines a 13 to 12 ratio. Click again. again. And that's figures compared to a standard, and the difference between the sample and the standard is called the relative 13 content or the delta 13. Click please. And it's got that little symbol that you see all the time in stable isotope papers. Click again. And it's measured in parts per thousand, not parts per hundred. Click again. And if a sample has a ratio less than the standard by five parts per thousand, it has a delta 13 value of minus, minus five parts per thousand. Okay, click again. So what does it all mean? Hey, so what does it all mean? Click again. Uh, Okay, so what, what you look for at carbon, you can look in, in stable isotope analysis in carbon, you can look at carbon C3 and C4 because that tells kind of what kind of plants an animal ate. But what we're more interested in is the C13, C14, and C, or C12, C13. C13 is found in greater quantities in marine animals than in terrestrial animals. And what you see over time when you do these stable isotope analysis, over time you see sort of this movement toward more C13. And the reason for that is that early man was such a, 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 a outstanding hunter that he generally wiped out all the big game wherever he was. And after the big game was gone, he was left with smaller game, which was less preferable. And then with, with um, aquatic life, not necessarily marine life, but it can be snails and mussels and fish uh, and, and turtles and things that he could get like that. And so you see this over time is that it goes from the big game to a more uh, marine animal kind of a profile. Next, please. And so this higher C13 in, indicates a diet higher in seafood or aquatic food. Click again. And indicating a switch, which we just talked about. Okay, click again. So, but N15 kind of tells the story on the meat eating. Again, please. So plants contain a fairly constant N15, click again. And when herbivores eat plants, they concentrate the N15, just like fish concentrate mercury when they eat it. You know, the smaller fish get it, and then a bigger fish eats a smaller fish, and it concentrates the mercury. And ultimately, when we go buy a can of chicken of the sea, <laughs> we're getting a lot of concentrated mercury. And so the same thing when herbivores eat plants, they concentrate the N15. And so it's typically about five to 8% in their collagen. And so when you do this on a known herbivore, this is what you find. Click again, please. Once more. So if it contains a level greater than the local, by 7% greater than the local flora, click again, that usually tells you that it's an herbivore because it's concentrated the, the N15. Click again, that's more. Now, what about hunters? These guys are laying in wait for this thing. Anybody know what that is? Hmm? Actually, it's a, it's a predecessor to the armadillo. Click again, there it is. Click again, it's, it's called a glyptodon. And these were all over South America and up to the southern part of the United States, and they were hunted to extinction by early man. They were about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, but a, a, little, bit, a little bit flatter. And in case you think these didn't really exist, click again. There's one in a museum in Berlin. There's the carapace and there's the skeleton. Click again. And you can see a skull up close and personal, and you can see the, uh, you know, the dentition of an herbivore. And so early man hunted these to extinction. So what would we find? In, in terms of stable isotope analysis on early man. Click again, here's what you find. These are Neanderthals. So what you look at down here is, you know, this is a bison. This is a, whatever this is, this is an herbivore of some kind. This is another herbivore. And a, this is a deer and this is another herbivore. When you get to the Neanderthals, they're way up here. So you can see that they're concentrating the, uh, the, the nitrogen 15 from the herbivores that they ate, because if they were herbivores, they would all be down here too. Okay, click once again. 
and it says the European Neanderthal diet indicates that all physiologically they were presumably omnivores, they behaved as carnivores, with animal protein being the main source of dietary protein. Now this is all work done by Michael Richards, who's the guy that's sort of a real pioneer in this stable isotope analysis. And <clears throat> I met him and spent some time with him, MD and I both did, in, in Hamburg, Germany about 15 years ago when he was just getting started. And now he's at the Max Planck Institute and he's a big name in the field. And I contacted him before I put this talk together and said, hey, is all this data still right? And he said, oh yeah, we've got tons of it. And it's, it just confirms what we found in the early papers. Uh, so go ahead and click again. And the uh, click once more. And so this is the early Modern Human Diet, another Michael Richards paper. And this is 12,800 years before present. And if you look here, you can see these are all herbivores. And this is an Arctic fox over there, which we know is pretty much of a carnivore. And you notice the humans are way up here, which what that tells you is that not only did they eat herbivores, but they ate carnivores too, because they concentrated the nitrogen 15 from the carnivores that they ate. And so you can actually call humans super carnivores, I guess, for lack of a better term, because they concentrated so much. Now what this doesn't tell you is it doesn't tell you how much carb they ate. It only tells you that they ate a lot of protein, that they ate a lot of meat. But you would assume that they, if they ate enough meat to put them way up here on the curve, they didn't have a lot of room left for carbohydrate. But we don't know. It doesn't tell you that. So click please. And click. That's just a whole bunch of data. Click and once more, and this is a summary. We were testing the hypothesis that these humans had a mainly hunting economy and therefore a diet high in animal protein, and we found this to be the case. So that was the conclusion of this paper, and if you read all these papers, they all say the same thing. Okay, click again. Okay, now I want to, to talk about a really interesting study done by Claire Cassidy from the Smithsonian. And this is, this is a great paper. This is on my website. Also, the expensive tissue hypothesis is on my website if you want to get the whole thing and read it because they're both fascinating papers. But Claire Cassidy uh, was an anthropologist at the Smithsonian, and she was looking at the difference between hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists. An anthropologist can just take a glance at a bunch of skeletal remains and say whether they're hunter-gatherers or whether they're agriculturalists because health went to hell in a handbasket when agriculture came along, and you can see it in the skeletons. So they can notice this, and what she did is she wanted to look at two populations that were really from the same location, at, but were separated really just by diet. And what she was really looking for was two populations that were both non-nomadic. And so she found this in Kentucky. There was a group in western Kentucky that were farmers uh, that lived about back in about 14, 1500, and they were pre-contact, but there was nothing found with them that indicated that they had any contact with Europeans. All our Europeans had been over here. Uh, yeah, here. The, uh, and the uh, other ones were in eastern Kentucky, and they were 2,500 years old, and they were hunter-gatherers, but they, unlike most hunter-gatherers who are nomadic, these people lived in fixed settlements. Okay, click please. So. She wanted to look at two different societies with different means of subsistence. Click again. And the study said, click again, skeletal remains, at 285 hunter-gatherers, 296 farmers, click again. Uh, hunter-gatherers lived in western Kentucky about, oh, 3500 BC, okay, so a long time ago. Click again. The farmers lived in eastern Kentucky, had those backwards, 1500 AD, uh, click again. And they were both pre-contact, click once more, and probably the same genetic material. I mean, they're in the same place. The, these probably, these probably were the uh, ans or these were probably the ancestors of those. Uh, click again. Click again. Okay, so the hunter-gatherers ate a low-carb diet, composed because, you know, uh, by this time. The really good hunters had gone through and pretty much wiped out the big game. You know, from the time they started at one end all the way to the bottom of South America, it took about a thousand years to wipe out the big, big game. And so these guys ate a low carbohydrate diet, river mussels, snails, deer, black bears, small animals, turkey, turtles, fish, an occasional dog, uh, 
pretty much like we do, occasional dog thrown in every now and then. <laughs> they, they gathered wild grapes, acorns, blackberries, sunflowers, and hickory nuts. Look again, please. And then the farmers ate a low protein, high carb diet composed primarily of corns, beans, and pumpkin. They got wild plants and had the occasional deer, elk, or turkey. Not very often, turtles and fish were on the menu now and then, and corn was the weaning food for young children. Click again. And here's what, you know, you might say, how, how do you know that these people were sick? How do you know what was going on with them? Well, this is where the paleopathology comes in. And this is called, see this kind of moth-eaten, grungy stuff on the skull? That's called parotid hyperostosis. And that is a symptom of iron deficiency anemia. If you see this, this is this moth-eaten, cruddy-looking stuff inside the eye socket. That's called cribra orbitalia. And that also is a symptom of iron deficiency anemia. And both of these things are extremely painful. So that's one way that you can look and see if uh, people have had enough meat or not. Uh, if, are they iron deficient? Click please. And so these are signs of iron deficiency. Click again. And you've got to be pretty anemic before you get this. And it's commonly found when society switched to an agrarian lifestyle. Once again. And it was present in 50% of children under five years old in the farmers. And none in the hunters. 50% of kids were going around with this. That is really, really painful. Okay, click again. This is another sign that you look for, these lines in the tooth enamel, that's called enamel hypoplasia. That represents a fairly severe nutritional stress because during the growth time when this was going on, uh, the person doing the growing couldn't lay down proper tooth enamel. So when you see this, you know that it was pretty severe nutritional stress to develop enamel hypoplasia. Click again, please. I'll click again. Again. And it's vastly more prevalent among farmers, among agriculturalists. It's one way you can really tell about agriculturalists because they're relying on basically crops. And if something happens to the crops, they're screwed. And they don't have anything else to eat. They're not skilled hunters because they've had generations of people growing stuff. And when they have a crop failure, a drought, something like that, they're in a bad way. Okay, click please. This is another thing you can look at. These are called Harris lines or growth arrest lines. You see these radiographically in, uh, in skeletons. And these are, are found in times of sort of episodic brief nutritional stress, not prolonged intense nutritional stress, but brief nutritional stress. Uh, stress. Click please. And these are more common among hunter-gatherers because they probably did have a little bit of stress, but when they had it, they picked up and moved on somewhere and found something else. These people are sedentary. Click again. And, uh, oh, and it, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, tooth decay was rampant in farmers. You can see that here. You can see, you know, bad tooth decay. You can see this horrific looking uh, tooth abscess. Now this had to be painful. And we've all worked probably in emergency rooms in our training at least. And you know, when people come in complaining of a toothache and you take a tongue depressor and push around on it and you hit one of these that's got an abscess and you have to peel them off the ceiling. I mean, it really hurts. And this pus pocket can form down there. It can end up causing sepsis, a real, I mean, a real systemic in, in infection. So this is bad news. And I mean, I can't even imagine how much that must have hurt. And so tooth decay was rampant in the farmers. Click. An average of seven uh, cavities or carious teeth per mouth. Click. Tooth loss in children. They had kids that were losing teeth because of decay in the farmers. Click again. Average of under one in hunters. They had some tooth loss in old age secondary to wear. So we can see that the agricultural diet played hell with the teeth. Okay, click again. And this is, a, uh, I didn't mention it, but in the, in the, uh, the data on the Harris lines, uh, it was the same thing. The, the agriculturists didn't have that much, but the, the uh, hunter-gatherers had those. Uh, this is a syndrome of, uh, syndrome of periosteal inflammation that you see a lot in old specimens. Um, it's probably treponemal. Nobody really knows for sure. Uh, but it was thir time, 13 times as many farmers as hunter-gatherers had this disorder. And it's probably because the better diet of the hunter-gatherers gave them um, 
a better immune system to ward this off. Okay, click again, please. Other findings, click. Uh, the life expectancy was lower among farmers, click. Infant mortality higher in farmers, click. More farmer children infected than hunters, click. And overall, the agricultural hardened villagers were clearly less healthy than the Indian elders who lived by hunting and gathering. Now, I've spared you on this because in the paper, they're called hardened villagers and Indian nullers, and I could never keep which ones were the hunters and which ones were the gatherers straight. I kept having to go back and forth. So I've just called them farmers and hunters. So you've been spared the aggravation that I had to live through. Okay, click again. And this, uh, this whole thing is kind of mirrored by what Jared Diamond said, the adoption of agriculture, supposedly our most decisive step toward a better life, was in many ways a catastrophe from which we've never recovered. Now it's interesting because I think that agriculture, um, I mean, I don't, without agriculture, we probably would never have the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I mean, agriculture allowed us to specialize uh, and have certain people work and other people create, which I don't think would have really happened as much in a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So agriculture has been good for mankind, and I like to look at it in the same way that, that mankind has been good for cattle. If you look at cattle, cattle are, you know, cows are big and they're slow and they're dumb and dare I say it, bovine. <laughs> and they, uh, you know, if cattle were not good to eat or, or did not lend themselves to domestication, let's put it that way, if they did not lend themselves to domestication, they would long ago have been exterminated like the mastodons and the mammoths and the glyptodon and all the rest of them that were hunted, the cave bear that were all hunted to extinction. But cattle lent themselves to domestication, so we sort of formed this covenant with cattle that said, look, we're going to protect you, we're going to allow you to breed, and we're going to allow you to grow. And now we've got millions of cows out there, but the price they pay, which is probably small consolation to a steer trudging his way to slaughter, is that we're going to eat you. But what we're going to give you is we're going to allow you to survive and grow. So anyway. I think that you know the switch to agriculture was probably good for mankind, but bad for the individual man. Click again. Okay, now I want to get into the, the last part of this, which is the ancient Egyptian diet. Now you can see from this picture that everything in here involves wheat. Wheat was a staple of the Egyptian diet. Okay, click again. And here you can see this is Ramsey's Bakery. You can see them baking a million different kinds of bread and all the stuff that uh, revolved around wheat. Now about, I don't know, three years ago now, I guess, I was in Paris at loose ends. She was there with somebody and they all wanted to go do something else. So I went to the Louvre because they had an exhibition on Egyptian antiquities. And what I found in there were a million little figurines of Egyptians making bread. I mean, I almost OD'd on them. I mean, I took a bunch of pictures and I took a bunch of pictures and finally, I mean, it was just, there were, I mean, that's all there were. Click again, please. So, well, okay, what, what, what you find from <laughs> the Egyptian diet, as we'll discuss, was kind of a modern nutritionist nirvana. Click again. And here are some of these little figurines. You can see them making bread. You know, they're grinding away. Click again. I'm not gonna make you OD on it like I did but that you just see countless pictures like that or countless of these little figurines. It was a hugely important part of their diet. Click again, it was a staple, click once more, again. And it was a coarse ground whole wheat bread, click again, and it was uh, emmer wheat. Now a lot of people are going back to emmer wheat because of the book Wheat Belly and people want to avoid the modern dwarf wheat to so the old emmer wheat. Uh, people are starting to use that now. It doesn't have as much of a glycemic response. But that's what the Egyptians ate, was they ate emmer wheat. Now, this was really back-breaking back work to grind this stuff. And it took a lot of work and a lot of effort to do that. And they made it easier on themselves by sprinkling sand in it as they ground it. And so they would grind this and the sand would help them grind it to a finer consistency. The problem was it had sand in it. So then they came up with these methods of trying to sift the sand out that were far from perfect. So an Egyptian bread and an Egyptian wheat, you ended up having a lot of sand, some more than less. And if you read the old literature on this, you can see that the Egyptians back then would advertise, don't buy so-and-so's bread, it's, you know, it's grainy, it's, it's sandy. Mine's got much less sand than it. The point is that they all had sand in their bread. Okay, click again. 
and click again. I guess you are going to overdo something. So the Morton food of Egyptian was bread. This is from a Teeth and Bread in Ancient Egypt written by a dentist named F.F. F. Leeks. Click again. Uh, so well known that they were named Artofagoi, I guess, I don't know how to pronounce it, or Eaters of Bread. Click once again. And that the troops were given four pounds per day of this coarse ground whole wheat bread. Click once again. Now, they didn't just eat bread, although that was their staple. They had these elaborate netting systems and snare systems for migratory waterfowl along the Nile. Um, they used their, their large animals basically for beasts of burden. Those were too valuable to eat. Click again. And they would spear fish. You know, they would get fish in the Nile, and they actually had these ways of, of making little fish farms in the Nile where they could catch these things and keep them alive until they got ready to eat them. Okay, click again. But mainly, they ate wheat, and they ate a lot of it. Uh, click again. And if you look at their diet, it was primarily carbohydrates, bread, fruits, vegetable, honey, oils. They had olive, flaxseed, safflower, and sesame, all the oils that you can get by crushing the seeds. They didn't have corn oil. They didn't have vegetable oils as we know it. They had seed and nut oils and olive oil. They ate fish and waterfowl, and they ate occasional red meat. Now, this is the absolute diet that most nutritionists, not the people in this room, of course, but that most nutritionists would have us eat today to ward off heart disease and diabetes and obesity and high blood pressure and tooth decay and everything else. And remember, this was the ancient Egyptian diet. This was about seven or 800 years before people learned how to uh, refine sugar. I mean, sugar didn't exist then. That was their sweetener. It was honey. It wasn't sugar. Sugar had not been invented, so to speak. Click again. Click again. So these are, uh, this is, uh, I want you to pay attention to this a little bit and you'll see why a little later. These are, uh, these are things written in books by historians, ancient uh, historians of ancient Egypt. Some animals were raised to provide motive power for agricultural, others were raised as sources of food, thus adding a modicum of meat protein to the monotonous basic diet of carbohydrates. Click again. Fowl appear to have been abundant about hens and roosters. We can say only that is it's still their want today. They seem to have been all over the place. Click again. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, what did this great diet do for the Egyptians? Well, if you look at the pictures, if you look at the hieroglyphics, it looks like they were all in pretty good shape because their drawings are all sort of idealized versions of what they wanted to look like. Much like if you looked at Cosmopolitan today, you would think everyone in America was thin. And that's the same way it was in Egypt with their, with their drawings. But for whatever reason, their statuary showed the real thing. And, and this is a very common, common thing to see. You see bellies and you see boobs, gynecomastia. And I think this was brought about by all the phytoestrogens and all the wheat that they ate and all the plant food that they ate. Click again. And this is just all over the place. Here's another one, boobs and bellies. Click again, boobs and bellies, again. Now here's, here's, a, here's a female that's, uh, you know, I mean, she doesn't look like what you would see in Cosmopolitan, but she's not too bad. It's the men who really seem to be adversely affected by this. Click again. Here's, again, boobs and bellies. And this guy is actually sporting this belly. I took this picture at the museum in Berlin. And it's like he's proud of it. And who knows, they may have been. It could have been a sign that they were well fed back then. But as I say, this is really common in Egyptian statuary, this, this picture right here. Click once more. And another one, boobs and bellies, once more. And again, I mean, this is really common. And you can just see picture after picture after picture if you look at Egyptian statuary uh, of this, this syndrome right here. Okay, click again. Now, remember, that was on a diet that people would tell you to go on today to get rid of your boobs and bellies. And that's what they were on by default. Now, let's look a little bit at paleopathology like we did with the hunter-gatherers. Click again. Now, this, the nice thing about the Egyptian data versus the hunter-gatherer data, most of the data that you get, anthropological data, are skeletal remains, as they're called. You know, they're skeletons or they're bones from hunter-gatherers. The Egyptians are nice in that they have this massive amount of soft tissue data that's available to them. 
because of the mummification process that was part of their culture back then. And it's said that there are as many mummies in Egypt today as there are actual living people. So the database is enormous. And back in the 1800s, people sold these things. And you can see this guy here, he looks much like a few employees that I've had, but they, uh, they're selling mummies. And you could go to Egypt and buy a mummy and bring it home. And they used these for all kinds of things. They ground them up and made mummy powder out of it, which was supposed to have all sorts of medicinal effects. And in old uh, formularies, you would see mummy powder as an ingredient. Uh, they used them to make paper out of. They used them for all kinds of things. And there were just a seemingly unlimited supply of them. Click again, again. And this guy came along, Mark Armand Rufer, who was a, a Brit of, uh, of kind of French heritage. And click again. And he was a pathologist, and he was in Egypt, and he decided that he was going to do autopsies on some of these mummies. And the problem is, obviously, they're desiccated. So he fooled around, and he came up with this solution called, appropriately enough, roofer solution that would hydrate mummies so that they could be sectioned and be looked at histologically. And it's still in use today, the same way he designed it, Rufer's solution. If you're going to autopsy a mummy and do sections, that's what you get. And what Rufer discovered, next slide, is that mummies were crawling with heart disease. Now, this is interesting because he drew all these pictures of what he saw. So back then, if you were a pathologist, you know, you didn't have the cameras on the microscopes. You had one eye on the scope and the other eye on the paper, and you kind of drew what you saw. And so his, his books and his papers are all filled with these drawings that he did of his findings on, on the autopsies of mummies. And the thing that he noted, click again, that was interesting to him is that there was so much coronary vascular disease. And he said, I cannot therefore at present give any reason why arterial disease should have been so prevalent in ancient Egypt. I think, however, that it's interesting to find that it was common and that 3,000 years ago it represented the same anatomical characteristics as it does now. Now remember, these were all people who were eating the same diet that everybody would have us eat today to keep from getting heart disease, and the Egyptians were eaten up with it. Okay, click again. Now, this is interesting too. This is, click once more, this is the, the Ebers Papyrus, and this was a medical book written back in ancient Egypt. Click again, and I love this. It says, if thou examinest a man for illness in his cardia, and he has pains in his arms and in his breast and in one side of his cardia, it is death threatening him. I mean, that's a heart attack. It could be written in a medical textbook today. And so they clearly had heart attacks in ancient Egypt. Click again. In fact, here is, here is the, 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 earliest, suppose, the earliest record of sudden death. This was written in an old paper in 59, where they found this guy has collapsed here and they're tending to his wife and there she is. And this is sort of the Egyptian picture of despair and obviously he's gone down suddenly, who knows what it was, but this guy that wrote the paper uh, thought that it was probably the first recorded attack, at least that anybody's found, recorded uh, instance of a, of a heart attack. Click again. Now let's, let's look at some mummies because I said that they used to autopsy them and during Rufer's time, and Rufer died in World War I because he was coming back on a ship that got torpedoed and he died. And, uh, and so there was a lot of activity around his time, and then it got picked back up in the late 60s and 70s, and people started autopsying mummies again and found all the same things that Rufer found. But now we don't autopsy them as much. People scan them because they can get a lot more information and you don't destroy the mummy. So this is Hatshepsut, who was a famous queen, 1500 BC. Click, please. Click, oh, there we go. Okay, click again. And she uh, had terrible teeth, terrible dental problems. And you can see uh, from this, you'll see a little bit better later, but because of the sand in the bread, these Egyptians had a, a really um, uh, easily identifiable grinding down of their teeth that we can see a lot better in some other slides, but she, you know, she had it as well. Okay, next picture. And this is sort of, this is statuary, but it is um, sort of an idealized version of her because her actual mummy, there are rolls of fat in there that, that um, she was buried with. And she had bad health. She lived to be about 50. She had heart disease. She had what uh, appeared to be diabetes and high blood pressure because she had thickening of the, the vascular wall. Okay, click again. Now, 
tooth disease was rampant in ancient Egypt, and you can see this ground down appearance. That's from having the uh, eating this stuff, and you'll see it better uh, in a couple of slides later on, but it's this it's really characteristic picture of Egyptian mummy dentition. If you click again, and this is a kid, and you can see in the kid that it's even started there. This is a 10 year old kid. Okay, click again. Now there you can really see it. That's what it looks like, this ground down, shortened uh, tooth or dentition. Click again. And you can really see it there, and worn all the way down into the pulp. And that had to have hurt. And, I, and everyone has it. They all had it back then. So this must be something that they just lived with. Now there were a lot of, uh, not in here, but a lot of, of abscesses in, in in mummies, and I bet a lot of people died from it. Okay, click again. And there's where you can really see the characteristic ground down look. There's actually some enamel hypoplasia there too, but that's the ground down look of Egyptian dentition. Click again, and here's one getting ready to be scanned. Click, please. And this is Lady Rye. She died when she was 30 years old. She was a lady in waiting to a famous Egyptian queen. Click again. And she had some uh, aortic calcification at 30 years old. Click again. And in the, the, the heart wall, she had a, a big, uh, what people are claiming is, a, is an old MI that's been uh, uh, kind of uh, calcified and, and you know, repaired, not surgically, but uh, endogenously. Okay, click again. And here's another, again, you can see the the ground down teeth, but this is uh, carotid artery, uh, brachiocephalic and subclavian calcifications. Click again. You can see coronary calcification. Click again. And even iliac calcification. So they had arterial calcification all over the place. So they clearly had heart disease. Eating a diet that we would all be encouraged to eat to prevent heart disease. Okay, click again. Now, if you look at, this is a, a nice paper that I got this uh, diagram from, but this pretty, pretty much mirrors what you find in the Egyptians, but it's, it's pretty much the same for all mummies because hunter-gatherers didn't mummify. So pretty much all the, the societies that mummified their remains were agriculturalists. And what you find is that uh, under 30 years, 15% had atherosclerosis, under 30 years. 30 to 39 years, you're up at about 35%. 40 to 49 years, you're over 50%. Half of the people had it. They were 40 to 49 years old. When you get to 50 years old, probably a bunch of these died off, and so the survivors didn't have as much. But it was really widespread in the Egyptian population, heart disease. Click again. Now, this is interesting. I call this a, a post hoc analysis because Remember, I said, remember these old papers that talk about the Egyptian diet. These are historians of the Egyptian diet, historians, Egyptologists who knew what they ate, and they talked about this monotonous diet of carbohydrates. Well, here come new doctors. This was a Lancet paper from 2010 who are trying to make sense out of this notion that the Egyptians were crawling with heart disease. And so click. So this is what they say, click again. In this paper, the vast bibliography associated with the examination of Egyptian mummies provides overwhelming evidence of heart disease. Absolutely true. Now, click. The explanation for these frequent pathological findings almost certainly resides in a diet rich in saturated fat that was confined to the elite while most of the population remained vegetarian. Okay, so what they did was, was they, you know, they did this little logical syllogism that says saturated fat causes heart disease Egyptians had heart disease, therefore, Egyptians ate saturated fat. Okay, click again. And this is, uh, they end up concluding there is unequivocal evidence to show that atherosclerosis is a disease of ancient times induced by diet and that the epidemic of atherosclerosis which began in the 20th century is nothing more than history revisiting us to which I say, <laughs> WTF. I mean, talk about some reverse engineering. But this got me to thinking, and I thought, you know, I've never looked at the stable isotope data on ancient Egyptians, so maybe there's some papers on that, so let me look. So I looked, and what did I find? Click. I got, 
I'm inflicting you on all these figurines of people. Um, anyway, using isotope ratios, this is from a paper in 2014, the contribution of animal protein to the total dietary protein was estimated here at 29%, corresponding to an oval lacto vegetarian diet. Now, this is not the protein intake in the diet, not the protein percentage. Of the protein they ate, about a third of it was animal protein. The rest of it was protein from plant sources. Click. Taking into account potential biases, the proportion may have reached 50% of what they ate. Okay, click. And both estimates are lower than the average value of 64% characterizing modern omnivorous Europeans. So the amount of protein that they ate was really low. But were these, who are they talking about? Are they talking about the royalty? Are they talking about the common people? Click again. They, uh, another paper from 96, uh, which, which did this, uh, from uh, skeletal remains from the Nile Valley, said a rather surprising observation is the lack of differences between isotopic composition of remains of different social classes spanning from the very poor village of Gebeline to the middle class of the rich town of Asyut to the distinguished people who underwent mummification processes after their death. So they all, were the same. And you can see it in the teeth. The royalty had their teeth ground down. The commoners had their teeth ground down. Everybody had their teeth ground down because they all ate bread. Okay, so it was the same in royalty and it was the same in the commoners. They all had it. They had this nutritionist nirvana of a diet and they all got sick from it. And it's the very diet that a lot of people would have us all eat today. And so, if you look at the, the, the different data sources out there, click, You've got the metabolic constraints, the paper by Leslie Aiello that, uh, about uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis, which is interesting. I actually talked to her about this paper. She had a hell of a time getting it published. And uh, when she finally did get it published in, uh, in current anthropology, people were afraid it was gonna be too complex for their readers to understand. Read it, you'll see what I mean. That it was gonna be too complex for the readers to understand and it's ended up, I think, being the most cited paper in the journal. So anyway, click again. You got the stable isotope data, click. You got the hunter versus the farmer data, click. You got the ancient Egyptian data, click. And you've got modern randomized control trials, which as you all know, whenever you compare a low carb diet to a high carb diet, the low carb diet generally always wins. And it, at the very worst, it, it holds even. And if you didn't do it, using uh, intention to treat analysis. How many people know what intention to treat analysis is? Okay, if you didn't use intention to treat analysis, you'd see a, a much better picture even. But if you take all these together, click, you know, they all point sort of inexor <coughs> inexorably to the low carb diet, which I like to think of, I don't have it in the, in the slide, but like, <coughs> excuse me, Bob pointed out yesterday, my friend Richard Feynman's quote about the low carb diet should be the default diet. Not necessarily means it's the absolute best diet for everybody, but because of all this sort of diverse data, it should be the default diet that people try if they've got a problem. And so with that, thank you very much. And if we've got time, and I don't know if we do, I can take questions. Uh, we have a few minutes, we started late. So it would be really cool if we could do um, analysis of tissue of true ancient hunter-gatherer <coughs> mothers. Mm -hmm. But the point is, there aren't. There's, it's, uh, foss it's fossil. Yeah. But well, there was one that was there, frozen. And you yeah, guys, yeah. There, 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 are some, there are some the Inuit. Yeah. Evolutions, but we saw that paper, and, and I actually made an argument that they weren't necessarily true hunter-gatherers by because they were in London like the um, 19th century, and they already had exposure to sugar and, and mm -hmm. modern. No, no, I'm talking about the guy found in the ice that had the uh, uh, arrow in his back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, a, he was an agriculturalist, so that was, yeah, yeah, that was only five years ago. His, his belly was full of grain. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ozzy or Otzi or whatever his name was. Yeah. Those are all, uh, yeah, those are all agriculturalists. Yeah, yeah. And, and so there was a paper, though, that tried to say, oh, we found these mummies that are ancient hunter-gatherers, the Aleutians. And um, he 
said, well, see, they got heart disease too. Yeah, yeah. no. And well, the, you know, the, <laughs> it's interesting the, the illusion, uh, uh, the, um, yeah, the Inuit, they, um, part of their problem was that uh, they live, you know, they live in igloo. If you talk about, uh, if you read any of the, the sort of the contemporaneous literature from back in the 1800s and you even read Stephenson's stuff from the early 1900s, they spent a ton of time in these igloos and they all smoked and they had fire and their lungs looked like the lungs of smokers. And I think that that sort of uh, hampered their, their longevity. And the other interesting thing that Stephenson brought up about them is that they believed that whatever was good for adults was good for kids and their kids were smoking at seven or eight years of age. I mean, as soon as they were old enough to be able to smoke and you know, and the Indians developed tobacco basically in North America. And so there was all this trade back and forth. So who knows how long the Inuit had tobacco. Yes? I think the isotope data is a, such an excellent argument. Do you know if anybody's gone back and sort of critiqued these other conclusions that were drawn about the, you know, the low fat diets being beneficial and then you could say, no, these mummies were eating grain. What's the matter with you people? Yeah. I just wondered if that's made it out to the... No, not, you know, not really. That's a really kind of a super specialized thing. That, Egyptologists don't read that medical literature. Yeah, exactly. People, people, medical people don't read the anthropological literature. And, and so it's, uh, I mean, it's really interesting. The whole, the whole idea of uh, stable isotope analysis, I think, is just fascinating. And it's, you know, it's, it can so accurately determine things, and most people don't know anything about it unless they're involved in that field, which I didn't even know about it in the Egyptians. It's just when I saw this argument, I thought, wait a minute, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if there are papers on that, and I'm gonna look, and sure enough, there were. So there are papers out there on all this stuff, if, if you look for them. But I don't think anybody other than Michael Richards and me are making arguments about, you know, that um, they strongly imply that early man ate a lot of meat. One more question. No, oh, they got two over there. Uh, so, uh, one question would be you were talking about the kind of expansion of the human brain and mm -hmm. playing a big part in that. Well, there are also other hypotheses in terms of cooking and particularly cooking of starches mm -hmm. um, playing a role in that as well. Mm -hmm. so I was wondering what you thought about that, and especially if we consider uh, contemporary societies or hunter gatherers who do eat quite a hard, high carbohydrate diet, and those who have been studied do not have heart disease, obesity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly, uh, I mean, humans can eat a wide range of foods and do well. Uh, you know, I'm sort of a, one of my heroes is Frederick Bastiat, the French uh, philosopher and economist who had this great article about that which is seen and that which is not seen. And basically, uh, you know, you see what's seen and you don't see what isn't seen, which seems pretty obvious. But it really isn't when you think about it, because what isn't seen is how the Catavans and, and these other groups that I'm sure you're referring to would do if they had a higher protein, lower carb diet. That's the not seen part. And what we do know is that the Egyptians had that diet and it didn't do them a lot of good. But they were eating wheat, not, not Right, food. right, right, right. I, you know, I understand, I understand it. It's just that, yeah, and, and I think that, uh, and you know, Gary Taubes and I have discussed this ad infinitum, but I think that that there's some sort of metabolic damage that takes place in people that eat sugar and highly refined carbohydrates. And once that has taken place, whatever it is, I don't know if it's in the hypothalamus, I mean, I don't know where the damage takes place. But once it's taken place, about the only thing you can do is put them on a low carbohydrate diet to make them get better. But if people don't ever eat that, they probably do fine on these other things, but we still don't know if they would have done just as well or better on, on primarily a meat-based diet. Yeah, Ian Spreadberry, who I believe is now a member, has uh, some great papers on acellular carbohydrates, yeah. probably being the difference, you know, starches such as tubers, acellular versus, say, wheat and ground, yeah. bread is acellular. Yeah. Daryl, did you have a question? Very similar. Actually, actually, yeah, there was, there was another point. Um, but I, 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 there was a, uh, a composite of uh, hunter-gatherer diet, something Bowen called Dane, 
uh, published this, uh, 211, I think 211 populations. Um, and um, there was a significant uh, array or proportions of macronutrients. Mm -hmm. And the sort of, the, the, the weighting seemed to be around, you know, sort of 45, 55 plant-based to animal-based protein. Um, and you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, what Lauren Cordain did, this guy named uh, DeVore did a, did a paper, because this was a conference called Man the Hunter in Chicago back in 1965, and they used the ethnographic uh, atlas, which is a list of all the sort of the excellent hunter-gatherer populations, and they looked at what they ate, and the people that put this together came up and said they ate 65% plant foods and 35% uh, animal foods. And Cordain took it, uh, took the same ethnographic atlas and re-looked at it and found out that they didn't include small game in that. They didn't include fish in it. They didn't include mollusks. They didn't include a lot of stuff that hunter-gatherers ate. They just pretended that didn't exist and just strictly looked at large game versus plants. And when he looked at the whole thing and reanalyzed it, he came out with just the opposite, that, that uh, most hunter-gatherers ate about a 65% animal-based diet and a 35% plant-based diet. Some hunter-gatherers went all the way up to 90%, 95% animal-based, and a few were down at the lower, you know, 20% animal-based. But the vast majority, the average, was 65-35. And that was Cordain's paper, I think it was a 2001 paper. All right, but the spread was pretty wide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Cordain's paper, the spread was pretty wide. Yeah. Average is the receiving one, you know. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you.